Remember telling the story about Latimer and Riley? They were priests that came to know Christ as their Savior, and they rejected Catholicism and uh, began to stand for truth and preach truth, and they were arrested and condemned to burn at the stake if they did not deny Christ. And I believe it was uh, Riley that was a little bit frightened about it, and Latimer told him to play the man, not be afraid that they would start a, their fires would start a, uh, uh, the, their, the smoke from their own life would start a fire in England that would never go out, and it did. Um, when you bury someone in America, you go to the Washington Monument up here, you go to uh, Arlington Cemetery, you've got nice graves that they preserve and take care of. John Knox is buried under pavement. And Riley and Latimer are buried under a street corner. That's the respect England has for great men of God. And that's the very respect that Lot's trying to push here in our country about truth and right. So uh, let's get serious about the Lord. I don't know. I don't guess we're going to get it, are we, guys? Oh, uh, go ahead. Imagine living in a country with over 56 million people where the vast majority has little or no interest in God or the Bible and the fastest growing religion is Islam. In this country, less than 6% of the entire population will attend a religious service of any kind. Hundreds of churches have been sold and turned into mosques, pubs, or housing developments. With the decline of Christianity and the rise of false religions, many have never even heard the gospel. This is the country of England. We are the Weedman family, missionaries to the country of England. I'm grateful to God for the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. As a child, I attended Calvary Baptist Church in Ypsilanti, Michigan. I was saved at the age of nine after a Sunday evening service. I was afraid of going to hell because I knew I was a sinner. My parents showed me from the Bible how I could be saved. I repented of my sins and believed upon Christ as my Savior. Complete assurance and peace came into my heart and life. I was later baptized by Pastor Hall. While in high school, I surrendered my life to do God's will. God led me to train at Crown Bible College in Powell, Tennessee. God called me to preach during the summer of my sophomore year while reading Luke 10:2. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. During my time at Crown College, I was given the opportunity to study and serve God in England for five months. While I was there, God began to burden my heart for the people of England. I graduated from Crown College with a bachelor's in pastoral studies and a master's degree in ministry. I then began working for Pastor Fittis in McMinnville, Tennessee, and in 2010, Kimberly and I were married. As the assistant pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, God allowed my wife and I to serve in many different areas, from working with teens to leading music and overseeing the soul winning program. In 2014, at a missions conference, we surrendered our lives to be missionaries. As I was reading Mark 1.38, God called us to the country of England. Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. We count it a privilege and a great responsibility to be ambassadors for Christ to the people of England. I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was five years old on July 4, 1991. After a special service at our church, I realized that I was lost and my parents explained to me from the Bible that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior. I knelt beside their bed and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to save me. A few months later, I followed Christ's example and was baptized. My father was in the Air Force and in 1992 we moved to Okinawa, Japan. While we were there, we attended Maranatha Baptist Church. And it was during a missions conference, when I was eight years old, that I surrendered my life to serve the Lord. In 1995, my family and I moved to Powell, Tennessee, and we began attending Temple Baptist Church. I met Jamie while I was attending Crown College of the Bible. We were married in August of 2010, and I joined him in McMinnville, Tennessee. As a young teen, I would hear English missionaries speak of England's great need of the gospel, and the Lord began to place a burden in my heart for the people of England. I had already developed an interest in the country of England as a young child 
due to my grandparents being British and my mother being born in Cambridge, England. We are humbled and excited that the Lord would choose us to help spread the gospel to the people of England. England is located in Europe and is part of the United Kingdom. The entire country could fit into the state of Florida, yet there are three times as many people living in England. Among its beautiful scenery and historic castles are well-known places such as the Tower Bridge, Westminster Abbey, Warwick Castle, and Buckingham Palace. England is also known for its worldwide influence through the University of Oxford. The city of London is one of the most ethnically diverse cities on earth with over 300 different languages spoken. In this city alone there are over 400 mosques. England was once a country rich with Christian influence with revivals, preachers, and missionary movements. Men such as Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley, George Mueller, and others once stood faithful for God in this land. Where once England shone brightly with the light of the gospel, it is now a spiritually dark place. But we believe that God can send revival again. Some would say that the people of England are closed to the gospel, but we believe that they are not gospel hardened, rather they are just ignorant of the gospel. The gospel still is the power of God unto salvation, and the task of reaching the British people with the gospel is possible with God. It is our desire to evangelize the lost, disciple believers, train nationals to do God's work in England, strengthen and encourage remaining churches, and start local New Testament churches. We realize the great responsibility God has given to us as we endeavor to take the gospel of our Lord to the lost people of England. My name is Jenna Harvey and I'm from Exeter in England and I'm engaged to Kimberley's brother Sam. There's such a great need for the gospel in the country of England. My mom didn't hear the gospel until she was 30 years old and that's when she got saved. But she prayed for my dad for eight years before he finally accepted Christ as his savior. I'm so thankful that the gospel reached my home and I was able to grow up in a Christian family. My dad is now the pastor of a church in England and the closest Bible believing church to us is two hours away. Please pray that the Lord would continue to work in the country of England and that he would send more laborers to work there. Please pray that God would use the Weedman family in England for his glory so that Christ might receive the reward for his suffering. I say, don't you love the way the English speak? Uh, good to have you. Brian, are you guys ready? That was great. Uh, Y'all think about this guy. I think that'd be good. They're going to work with some families over there when they go over there. A church that's already established, get their feet on the ground, so you think about them. Okay, Brian. Come on in, have a these guys. Once I get up here, can have a seat. We got some slides that we're going to show you. Um, we had a theme for the week that we went um, up north and traveled all around, and it was that you were created for a purpose. And we always try to do a theme, and all the lessons tie into it, and everything we did, we try to tie this into it. So um, I'm going to flash through some pictures to start with, and some of the young people have a few things to say. We got some scripture to quote for you, and a song. But uh, let me just kind of give you a glimpse into the picture. Now, some of these pictures you've probably already seen. Uh, those of you who are on Facebook and Instagram and, um, yeah, social media. But uh, on Monday, we gathered. We left the church here. Uh, this is the group. We're missing a few of them tonight. But we had a good group. 
And um, Brother Rob came up, let us in a word of prayer. He um, wasn't quite awake, but he still let us in a word of prayer anyway to pray for our trip. Now, and our prayer request was the bus ran great, and it did, so we praise the Lord for that. Um, I mentioned to the young people and their families that I don't like a lot of idle time. And four and a half years ago, the very first trip that we took up to Boone, uh, we got on the bus, all the young people threw their hoods up, covered their faces, brought in their pillows, went to sleep, put their headphones in. And I thought, what in the world? We've got to change this. So, after four and a half years, they can tell you, there wasn't a whole lot of sleep time on the bus. One of the first things we did was a speed friending game. This was where everybody sat by everybody for three minutes, took their notebooks, and learned as much as they could about the person they were sitting beside, whether they liked them or not. They loved it. It was great. But it made them be interactive. It made them meet other people that they normally wouldn't. Um, each day we had group devotions, or most of the days we had group devotions. Um, on Monday, Dallas brought the group devotion on God's purpose for Noah, again, dealing with purpose. Um, throughout the week, every time we traveled, we had different games. This game right here was called Bad Joke Telling. Um, it was horrible, and um, so we laughed at how bad it actually was. It's a great time, uh, but anyway, we try to keep the kids interactive, and uh, if we weren't doing something, they figured something else out to do, whether it was with rubber bands, thanks to, thanks to my niece who brought plenty of those, or Dallas just telling stories, which I'll have him share momentarily. Did you want Dallas to share a story, Dad? So, real quickly, I'm going to pause right here. So, um, one of the things that we did, let me back up a picture, is... Uh, I was working on trying to get the intercom system working on the bus, and the thought hit me Sunday night after I got home. Um, I wonder if I could download an app to my phone. That's a microphone, and I did. We plugged it into the stereo, and so we had a microphone through my phone over the entire bus. Well, Dallas decided that he was going to download the same app to his phone and plug his phone in, and he would come up and sit at the front of the bus and tell stories. And uh, we were crossing over uh, the Mississippi River in Ohio one day. So, so that's what he told the young people. And, um, and basically, the rest of the trip, the Mississippi River covered everywhere that we went and filled up the Great Le Lakes. And um, when we went through the Smoky Mountains, he explained how the Smoky Mountains and the Colorado Rockies were together about 40 years ago. And Dallas, can you share with us just a second how they split up real, real quick? Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's true. About 40 years ago, I was up there with my grandpa. He lived on the, uh, the Smokies. Uh, one night, a great earthquake came, separated them. Then in the middle was the Grand Canyon that separates what is now known as the Great Smokies and the other mountains that were mentioned. I don't remember what they were, but it's kind of how it happened, and that's pretty much it. His, uh, you guys must make him nervous. Like His stories would go on sometimes 20 minutes, and one day he sat there for an hour solid, and all the kids are glued to him. We actually canceled games to let Dallas keep telling stories, but that was fun. And uh, Pastor Rob, that's probably the reason your boys wanted to stay on the bus and hear a few more stories of history and geography and all that stuff, all right? Um, it wasn't all fun and games. Uh, we also um, let them watch both of these DVDs, Noah's Flood, Washing Away Millions of Years is a great DVD. If you haven't seen it, um, it's in the library. And the second one that we watched on Wednesday, uh, Thursday was the Creation Seminar by Dr. Kent Hovine. Um, when we got to the ark, it was pretty massive. It was neat watching the kids' faces just walking up to it. 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high, five stories, and it's just a huge, huge thing. There's a lake, if you can't see from the TV, there's a lake in between us and the boat. That's how far back the boat is behind us. Um, we walk all the way around it. I've got a few pictures going through it. Some of the young men um, wanted to show their strength, failed mightily, but it was a great picture. And uh, just going through the boat, um, we locked a few of them up. Um, Pastor Rob, that's one of yours again. Uh, Devin, here's the other one in there. And uh, I happened to see this picture, green beans, really? I mean, of all the vegetables they could have taken on the boat, I don't think that was accurate. But anyway, we'll move on. What was neat is walking through the boat and uh, through the, the ark and just seeing all the different things, whether it be murals, whether it be the life-size um, replicas of people, their living quarters, and how they might have kept the animals. And for me, being a youth director, what was awesome is having the kids ask me questions. And probably for the first hour, hour and a half, it felt like all I did was just answer questions about the Bible. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know how often your kids come up and ask you questions about the Bible or for an hour solid. So it was awesome. And then you start giving an answer, you'd have three or four of them gather around to listen. And uh, I, I loved it. It was, it was pretty neat. On Tuesday, we had a little bit more fun. We went to Kings Island. It's a theme park. We rode a lot of roller coasters. And yes, I stole some of these pictures off of Snapchat. You'll ask me how I did that later, but I did. So, um... The very first roller coaster, we walked through the door, we jumped on this one right here, the Banshee. And I looked at Sydney, who wanted to ride it, 
and uh, she likes, um, what's the one at Disney World that you like? Space Mountain. And I said, honey, I said, are you sure you want to ride this? Yes, sir, I want to ride it. I'm like, Space Mountain is like a Ferris wheel compared to this roller coaster we're about to get on. That's fine, I'll ride it. When it ended, after she screamed for two and a half minutes, she's yelling, Space Mountain's a Ferris wheel, Space Mountain's a Ferris wheel, Space Mountain's a Ferris wheel. And then she was done for roller coasters for a while. But um, then we had other guys that got off the roller coaster. This was uh, Jalen. And uh, that's a rainbow coming out of his mouth. But all of them, uh, we did have one young man that hugged a, um, a trash can for the next 20 minutes. But anyway, it was all fun. We threw him back on roller coasters, kept him going. And uh, we rode lots and lots of roller coasters. Um, Tyler's face, a little panic there. But uh, he still got on the roller coaster. They didn't have all roller coasters, but they had a lot of them. Some guys did a few different things. We had a blast with the kids there. Um, I asked Katie why she gets in so many pictures. She photobombs everybody, but then didn't want to get up and say anything tonight. But anyway, finally they began to wear down. They were getting tired. We finally called it a night. And um, yes, that's me behind the counter making drinks. The kids thought this was great. We got to Steak and Shake right across from our hotel. It's late. We've been at the park all day um, from 10 to 30 that morning, 11 o'clock that morning, and it's now at almost 10 o'clock that night. And uh, for 20 minutes, they didn't bring our drinks. So I just went over and asked the waitress. I'm like, look, I know you're shorthanded. Would you mind if I make these guys drinks? Here's a list. Help yourself. There's cups. There's ice. So I went back there, made drinks. Actually came back there and served them, and the young people thought it was hilarious. I did not get tips, um, so uh, we'll pick those up later. For those guys that know me, I pl- try to plan out every detail of every day, like I don't like a lot, a lot of free time. And then something like this happens, and you can't plan for everything. Sometimes a God throws curveballs into your schedule and your day, and he takes over. Um, but uh, McKenna ended up in the hospital. You guys know that. Um, pray for her that the infection goes down so they can get that stent removed this week. Right, McKenna? Pray. She wants that thing out of there. She feels like something's poking her in the kidney always, so y'all keep her in your prayers. Um, in between running back and forth between the hospital, I had to take the young people to the Creation Museum that day. John gave a devotion. This is actually a game time, but I had, didn't have many pictures of John. Um, he actually gave a devotional that day on God's purpose and creation, staying with the theme of purpose. Both Dallas John did a great job. Andy was with us as well. Uh, We showed uh, a video when he got up and gave the kids a challenge off of that as well. Um, Andy and Kathy had to head up the Creation Museum. I had to miss that day running back and forth to the hospital. Um, But it's pretty neat. Uh, Hopefully some of the kids will talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, Camel rides, um, supper. You know, this right here, the reason I took these pictures and put them in here, is Golden Corral actually turned out to be an answer to prayer. You see, we were supposed to be traveling Wednesday night, and I was going to do the Creation DVD on Kent Hovind. Well, we're stuck in Cincinnati an extra day, and we left the Creation Museum at 3.30. I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to come up with something to do with 28 people in a hotel in a foreign city for an entire evening. And and it's not like I can put them down to bed at 7 o'clock. It's not going to work with teenagers. And so you begin racking your head, and I I began praying for answers. And I went and talked to the hotel staff, and I said, listen, can we use your meeting room? Um, You know, I just want to have like a little church service with the kids. And sure, you can have it for $200. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you can use our breakfast area where all, everybody's walking through. And so I met with the, all the room leaders, and I'm like, I guess that's what we're going to do. And I was praying about it. And the Lord said, why don't you go out to eat, and let's see what happens. So we went up to Golden Corral. Didn't even ask. They put us in their private room. I asked them, I said, can we shut the doors and have a little church in here? And they said, sure, take all the time you want. So I closed the doors, and they, I got to preach at them. It was great for about 20, 30 minutes. And as I'm closing the doors and sliding all the seats over, they're looking at me like, what in the world are you doing? But anyway, Golden Corral was an answer to prayer. And this picture right here I love. I don't even know if these girls knew that I took their picture. We challenged them each day to read their Bible. We gave them a chapter to read. We also asked them, we gave them a notebook and a pen, and we asked them, we said, when you read your chapter, find one thing in it that stands out. Just write down one thought that stands out. And it was neat. Thursday morning, I had been out the bus. I came walking in, and I see these two young ladies sitting there eating their breakfast with their Bibles, their notebooks, and their pens taking notes. I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty awesome. And that's worth, to me, this whole trip. And And I could have cropped the picture a little bit tighter, but there's a TV in the background. They forgot the TV and got in their Bibles, which is what we need to do. So this was Thursday. We made it down to Pigeon Forge real quick. Um, this is hard to see, but up here in the very top, uh, basically the Alpine Coaster is like a homemade roller coaster off the side of a mountain. And yes, parents, I knew you guys were praying, so I knew it would be fine. And uh, so um, we, made, we, we made a pack, and that pack was no brakes. So the roller coasters you control. It's a single little car. I'll show you a picture in just a second. And you have a brake on it. And uh, you can go whatever speed you want. And we just, I, I called them all in. So listen, charity pack, no brakes. I mean, you know, don't, don't whip out on me. So uh, some of them came down like, you know, four minutes behind the next car. 
I didn't hit the brakes, uh-huh, whatever. And others are on their bumper. But anyway, this is some of them. Um, Aaron looked a little uh, petrified. But anyway, he did good. Um, some of them were laughing. Some of them might have been crying a little bit. But I uh, have him rolling in. Don't really know what John was doing. Um, but anyway, he's up there as well. Um, that evening, we went to the island, uh, did this great uh, mountain wheel. Uh, we did roller coasters on Friday. We had a lot more fun with them. We took them to a number of different attractions. Uh, the girls may have screamed a whole lot through some of these. Um, but then I've got a few more pictures here, and then I'll turn it over to the young people in just a second. Um, I wanted to put some of these pictures as the wax museum. Um, they were just weird. So um, I saw a whole different side of our young people that I didn't know existed, and I thought I knew them pretty well. But... Um, yeah, these are some of the pictures right here. And uh, a a Amy's trying there. That's the muscles there. So uh, Micah doing the Titanic, Dallas, our ladies showing what they're made of. Um, we'll keep rolling. Hulk Hogan, Kaylee and uh, Haven getting swallowed by a snake, apparently. And uh, then we went up to the King Kong. We got VIP access up to the top of the Wax Museum. Don't ever buy it. Um, you go up on this metal thing, you stand behind King Kong's head in 95 degree weather, and you take a quick picture and rush back down, which is exactly what we did. So that was our picture right there. And um, yeah, so I'm going to pause for a second, and I'm going to let some of the young people share just for a few minutes about their experience. Who wants to go first? John, come on up. Sorry about that. Oh, all right. It was, a, it was a great week. It was a lot of fun. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the kids being away from the house and everything. We enjoyed them. We had a lot of fun. Uh, the part that stood out to me the most was definitely the ark. Because, you know, I, I know that I see it in, like, a little kid's book. The ark's not that size. You know, it's not the animals aren't falling out of the boat as they're, you know, sailing away. It's, I knew it was big, but it didn't really dawn on me how big it was until I actually got there and saw the ark. That thing was massive. It was big. But then another part of me that I just didn't realize was, like, okay, the ark's big. It has to fit all those animals in there. But as soon as I walked in the ark, they had all these boxes everywhere and all these stuff. I'm like, what is all this? And then I was like, they're, they're cages. That would make sense, right? They, they have to make cages for all the animals. They have to make cages or food storage places for everything. It just kind of like dawned on me. I, I didn't realize that. It, I still kind of thought it was like a fairy tale in a way. Like it just, God said it happened and it kind of happened. But no, it, I went in there and I saw how they would actually do it. And it kind of just became real to me right there that, you know, this actually happened. They actually built all this. They, this would happen. Like they even had a room in there that showed all, the, all these fairy tale books of how they depicted the ark and how sometimes they said like, they're brainwashing the kids to make it a fairy tale. You know, you see a little fairy tale picture on it. Okay, that's not believable. And then, you know, just very slowly in the back of your mind, you say, oh, it's not that believable. Until you actually go in there and you see the cages. You see all the animals and the difficulties they would have went through. But it, you know, it dawned on me that this happened. Like, it, uh, you know, God made it happen. They, they built it, did a lot of work. But it, it obviously could happen. So, to me, it just you know, wowed me that, you know, I, I just didn't realize that I would believed that the flood happened, but in the back of my mind, I still kind of was like a fairy tale in a way, you know, so it just, it opened my eyes more than I could have imagined, so if you haven't been in the Ark, I would definitely recommend going there, it's amazing. Alicia, you can stand there. She's my daughter, so I told her she didn't have a choice, she got to say something to you guys. Um, one thing that probably stood out to me the most was the planetarium at the Creation Museum. Um, got me thinking about how big the universe really is and how God created all of it and that he can hold all of that in the palm of his hand and um, how small we are compared to the rest of the universe and that he still created us and that he put us here for a purpose. I just want to thank y'all for letting us take your kids for a week. No, wait, that can't be right. 
No, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all should be thanking us for uh, taking your kids for a week. Uh, yeah, Rob. Okay. Uh, no, we had a we had a good time. Uh, kept them occupied. Kept them thinking. Uh, challenged them every day with the thought. Uh, one thing that I just thought about, which was pretty cool. Uh, Tuesday, we went to the amusement park. It was hot. We had to stand outside in lines with people we didn't know. Uh, but uh, Monday, the Ark was air-conditioned. Wednesday, the Creation Museum, it was air-conditioned. And uh, we got to learn about God. So I think that's a little bit better than an amusement park where you had to stand in line to get on a roller coaster for about a minute and a half. I just got to say. Um, yeah, I think uh got to know some of the kids a little better and uh, hopefully was a witness to them. And uh, then again, uh, then again, thank you for letting us have them. Uh, thankful that the bus ran the whole time and that the air condition worked on the bus. Really like air condition. It's really nice. It's really nice. Uh, I want to thank Brian for all the planning and uh, all the stuff he had to go through. He had a list of everything detailed. And yet again, when uh, difficult times came, we had to change our plans. He stayed cool, calm, and collective. And uh, just worked it out. And thank him, thank the pastor for letting us go. Thank all of y'all. Um, the one thing that stood out to me was the Ark Encounter because I just thought it was so amazing how, like, Noah put his whole trust and faith in him. And also, like, the fact that um, no matter how much, like, his friends picked on him and, like, um, made fun of him, laughed at him, just Noah just put his whole focus on the Lord. And I just thought that was pretty amazing, like, how, like, um, when God tells us to do something, that we need to listen to him, and no matter what people tell us, that just put our whole focus and trust in the Lord. And I just thought that was amazing. Is there anything, Micah? Okay. All right, Ashley. Um, so I had a lot of fun the, oh, the week um, <laughs> that we went. I didn't get to go to the Creation Museum. I was at um, the hospital with Kenna. Um, I did see the planetarium. We were, Brian and I were there for like 30 minutes, so that was pretty fun. Um, but what stood out to me the most was the Ark, for sure. Um, it's just so massive, and it's just so much thought goes into like the water system and how it works, and it was it was just neat to see it in person and see just how how grand it is, and it, it was just great. Um, a thing that stood out to me at the Ark was Noah and his wife, um, they were like a neutral race, and they had all the DNA to um, a neutral color, and they had all the DNA for all the races that we see, Chinese, like Latino and all that, and I didn't know that, so I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and just this week, uh, the week getting to know the kids, I didn't know a lot of the young ones, um, so it was fun to get to know them and hopefully be a witness to them, so I had a really good time, it was fun. So what was amazing was the ark. It was in, in like Amy's mind, and my sister said that it was uh, that Noah put trust in God. I mean, you know, and, as the friends would mock him and make fun of him, you know, he still said, "Okay, you, know, you, you you'll find out that you know God's bring a flood, and it's you know and it's not a joking matter." But he just turned to him like he just let them live their lives. But it was amazing that God that he did everything that God commanded. He put his trust in God. He he said, "Okay, Lord, you want me to build the ark? I'll do it." And he didn't complain. The what, what, what are we going to have to eat? Because God had food already there and he prepared. And it was kind of amazing that the ark and also it was so big. It was like you didn't, when you stand there compared, you know, compared to the twin towers. That was kind of that was kind of big ark, and uh, it was amazing. Um, Eva is out of town and she actually wrote something so I'll read what Eva said so this is Eva's account of how the youth trip impacted her it says on the youth trip I learned a lot about Genesis and its account of creation and the flood during the first day we went to the ark encounter the ark was probably the most inspiring thing for me it was very eye opening we got to see exactly how large the ark really was and how much Noah had to have trust in God to build something like this at a time when people had never seen standing water or rain Noah was ridiculed and made fun of every, every single day yet he never stopped trusting God Seeing the reality of these stories gives a real feel to the power and awesomeness of God. 
The Creation Museum, Museum was also very interesting and showed evidence of creation, including replicas of what happened in the Garden of Eden. The thing that impacted me the most was a room that had all the effects of sin around. The visual effect of this makes you really hate sin and how badly it can turn your life. I'm going to apply these to my life and be more careful when sin comes my way. We also watched a light show in the planetarium that was really cool. The whole trip was awesome and educational. I hope to do something like this again. Thank you, Brian and Kathy, for all the hard work you did for us. We loved it. So that was from Eva. And last, Kathy, can I say anything? Okay. There's an obedient wife for you. Um, so I got to experience being a mom to like 25 kids. And I'll have to tell you, don't try that at home. <laughs> Um, now, it's, it's really fun. Brian and I love these trips because we get to know your kids um, on a deeper level, and we can um, understand better how to pray for them individually. So we pray for each of these guys every night um, as a family. So um, one thing that stood out to me, like, like they said, Wednesday was just turned upside down for us. We were not expecting um, that Kenna had to go to the emergency room. It was just um, something very unexpected so it threw our schedule off and next thing I know I'm dropped off at the Creation Museum and I'm the mom in charge <laughs> and that's not me <laughs> so um, but one thing happened there that I want to point out that most of these kids did not realize and it was a huge encouragement to me um, as I'm stressing over you know keeping an eye on everybody making sure everybody's got food and you know everything's going smoothly and uh, you know, Andy's there helping me, and the guys are um, helping and pitching in. But I'm, like, trying to pay attention. All these young kids are everywhere, and there's people just crammed in this place. And as I'm sitting there, I was the last one to get my food. I am sit down, and I'm trying to keep an eye on everybody going around, and I see this older woman walk past with her walker. She has her lunch on her walker, and she's carrying a cup. And I think, that woman is not going to be able to fill her cup and go find a seat because she has to push her walker. And just as I'm about to get up, I watch one of our 12-year-old young ladies go and help this, young, this older woman. She takes her cup, she fills it up, she puts her own stuff aside. She brings her, and she's talking to this woman so sweetly. And um, the lady is saying, I need to find a seat. I don't have anybody to sit with. I just, you know, just put me over here in the corner. And um, these girls... 12-year-old girls move over and they say, come sit with us. And they welcome this lady. And <laughs> they sat and they talked with her for a long time. And it was such an encouragement to me because I had to go and take some of the young girls to the bathroom. I came back. There's a crowd of about six or seven young people, 12 to 14-year-old, listening to everything this woman is saying and taking it all in. And I'm like... That was such an encouragement to me because I'm thinking, we got stuff to do, people. we got to get out of here. <laughs> and they're just taking time and paying attention. And so that was just an, a huge encouragement to me. I don't think they even realized what an encouragement it was. And, so, and then later that night, I got to spend some time talking. Because we were stuck in Cincinnati, I got to spend some time with the young girls. And we get to see the struggles that they go through and um, difficulties that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. And it just opens our eyes to see, um, you know, these kids all need love. They need our attention. And we need to be praying for them each and every day. I hope each of y'all understand these kids need prayer. They face a lot in their lives, in their young lives. So um, we appreciate you giving your kids to us. <laughs> we had a blast. We really did. I'll wrap up with this. We had a lot of fun, as you heard. They learned a lot. But from a spiritual standpoint, as us being a church, they memorized Psalms chapter 1, which we're getting ready to quote. Kathy, we'll have you come on up. We're going to do that first. <clears throat> they read Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7. We're taking notes. They watched two Christian DVDs. They would visit the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter. They learned a new church song, which we're going to sing right after we quote scripture. They heard a lesson on God's purpose for Noah. They heard a lesson on God's purpose in creation. They had uh, heard a lesson from me where we were created for a purpose. They got preached at. And then we would grab the microphone and would say, hey guys, what did y'all read about today? And we would discuss it over the intercom on the bus and talk. And uh, so we tried to make it spiritual and fun and show them that that's the Christian life. They go hand in hand. 
You don't go to church to be spiritual and then the rest of your life is fun. We can incorporate that into both. So I'm going to have these guys stand. And we're going to quote Psalms chapter 1.
gonna have them put the music down and head on back to their seats as they're going. I'm gonna just end with this. Thank you guys so much, parents, for allowing them to go. Church, for your support, for your prayers. Um, a lot happened this week. Kathy and I were blessed. We enjoyed being with your kids, and uh, hopefully, we can do it again next summer uh, without the without any interruptions. McKenna does not want to be back in the hospital. Kevin. don't think I did it alone. I had a lot of help. Um, and, yeah, Andy Andy was there. Um, Dallas and John and Ashley, of course, were in the college and career class. And when they when I was talking to them, and they were like, we're too old. I said, look, I can, I can use leaders. Young people look up to leaders, and you guys can come. It's a different mentality. You're not coming to goof off with the kids and have a blast, although you're going to have fun. But come and be leaders, and I appreciate it. Of course, my wife was actually the one that taught them that song while we were driving. I just get to stand up here and look good. But uh, anyway, so thank you once again, church. Um, ushers. If you guys can come on forward, Chad, you guys are going to sing. Um, sorry, I'll let, turn that back over to you. You guys can come on up. Let's ask God's blessing on the offering. Brother Jay, would you lead us, please, sir? Lord, again, we do thank you for just giving us this church, Lord, and giving us the, uh, the young people that are still here. Lord. There's so many churches that don't have young people in it. And uh, we're just thankful that uh, they stay here. They look to you. They look to your strength. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for the leaders that are here in this church. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. But now, Lord, we just thank you for the gifts we're about to receive, we do pray that they're used for your glory, and uh, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Tell the story of all my 
Savior has done. Did I mention that I love you and how I worship and adore you when I can see no way he makes a Can't meet breaching with outside in the forest. James chapter 1, why don't we just go there? Good times. James chapter 1, we're back in this study. Practical Christianity. I hope that some of these thoughts so far have been a help to you. This evening we're going to continue on and look at this idea of a wherefore kind of faith. Look at this second idea that we started last week and really kind of move into the practical applications of watching what God has done for us and, and then watching how he works through us. And that's kind of where we're going tonight. So if you're there in James chapter 1 and verse 18 is where we'll begin tonight. The word of God says this, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in, the gla in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. 
But whoso uh, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Last time as we came to the verses just previous to this, we spent really all our time in verse 16 and 17, and we began to touch on verse 18, but we began to really emphasize and consider just how amazing God is of a, being a giver of good gifts. And we looked at those gifts that He has given to each one of us in our lives. And ultimately, we came to that point that the greatest gift that God has offered and probably most of us have received is that gift of salvation. He redeemed or He bought us back out of the slave market of sin. He justified or judicially set us free from the sin which once uh, enslaved us. And it's with that mind that James is writing here, and he moves into the practical daily applications of taking what we understand from the Word of God and from our salvation and living it out for the world to see around us. And it's there as we come to James chapter 1 and verse 19 that we read that word, wherefore, causing us to go back and look at what he had just said so we understand why now he's saying what he's saying. So because God has made you one of his own, you ought to walk, James says. We are not listening close to God or removing wrath from the heartbeat of our life. We are not putting aside worldly ideologies or actions to win God's great gift of salvation, but because of God's great gift of salvation. That's the idea that James is presenting to us in these verses here in this beginning chapter. So that's the idea where we're going to go from here. And as we saw last time that goodness of God... Let's begin this time with the grafting of God, first of all. At the moment of our salvation, we become a new creation in Christ. Paul tells us this way. uh, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How many of you are thankful that God takes your past and puts it out of focus so that's not what defines you? What a privilege it is to be defined as a child of God. What a privilege it is to be defined by that word Christian as we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We were outside of His family, and now God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, has grafted us into the family line, to His family line, for all eternity. He then uses the Word of God to cultivate that graft to conform us into the image of His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I spent one summer during high school working in an orchard. And as I look back, it was not fun at all in the summer heat to be out in that orchard working on those vines. But now as I recognize that work that I was doing by taking vines and cutting some off and uh, grafting some other ones in, it's a pretty intriguing process of God's creation. And really, that's what God has done for us. He's cut our past off and grafted us into the new family. And what you begin to see as you work in a vineyard like that is there's some pruning. There's some staking up of some struggling plants. There's some wrapping of some vines together to help stabilize them for strength. And as you look at all of that pruning and and staking and grafting process... It really is amazing to watch God do that in our lives as well and the lives of Christians. But notice this thought that Peter gives us as we walk, as we think about this grafting work of God. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what you find is God has chosen us and made us into royalty. He has challenged us to become something that is holy. And one of those special purchased possessions of God. Sometimes people confuse this word peculiar with being weird. 
what God is giving us here is that idea of something that is special and set apart for God. As a child of the king, we are different or to be different from the world. So as God grafts us into his family, what James is telling us is that our life or our vine is represented obviously to be of Jesus Christ or our obvious representation is to be of Jesus Christ. So with this thought of being grafted into God's family and as we see James talking about the engrafting work of the word of God, notice the changes that ought to take place in our lives as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And notice that it's a process through the rest of our lives. As Peter says, so that we would show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's why we're doing what we do as born-again Bible-believing Christians. Saved by grace, showing God's grace. So we notice first that because of our faith that we have placed in Jesus Christ, we ought to, letter A, have a change in our attitudes. James tells us that this change is going to take place, number one, by being intentional in our hearing. For sake of time, I'm just going to look at this verse from one point of view. But you notice these words in verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now, our main thought reading these verses is with interaction with other people. We have to keep our mouth closed and listen to other people. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever sat down and read the Bible and argued with God about it? You know, it's easy sometimes for us to say, God, I see what you're saying, but really this is the 21st century. I see that you wrote that years ago, but really are you asking me to do this in my family? And sometimes in our flesh, it's easy for us to argue with God. There's millions of people all over the world that do this every day. Maybe you've interacted with some of these people as you've tried to share the gospel with them. And what you find is that they are more interested in telling you that they are a good person. They're more interested in telling you that God, uh, the God that they believe in doesn't send people to hell. Or that they have their faith and you have your faith and all faiths are going to be okay because God is loving. They're arguing with the scriptures because they're unwilling to hear the word of God. These people, as they argue, uh, are arguing about the way of salvation. But look at what James says in verse 21. It says we ought to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save uh, your souls. This word meekness gives us the idea of being humble, which helps us to understand that thought that Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3 and 4. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, converted and become as a little child, ye shall not enter into the ch uh, kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, isn't it interesting? We talk about dying and resurrecting our old uh, fleshly nature. But isn't it interesting that as we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we humble ourselves as a child, and then many a times we resurrect this idea of adult, and we argue with God all the time about what he's trying to tell us as we grow in grace. He says we ought to stay humble, and we ought to hear, uh, be swift to hear, what God is telling us. So we see this need for us to humble ourselves and to uh, understand who we are and not be argumentative and uh, become wrathful in what God is saying. You see, for some reason, our sin nature that we're born with indulges in this argumentative, combative attitude. And if we're not careful, that argumentative person will miss salvation and that saved person who still stays argumentative with God will miss his sanctification process. Now, I can only imagine what's going on if my wife's watching by live stream or what my family is thinking as I talk about being less argumentative. You see, I have the spiritual gift of explaining why I'm always right. How many understand that gift? 
I'm just trying to help people understand, but you know, the older I get, the realize how little I am right. And so I think I'm getting better in this argumentative I, uh, um, process. And I, I think I'm being a little bit swifter to hear and slower to speak. But what this world cannot give anyone is the principles they need to have a change of attitude so that they can become more like Christ. So we have to come to God's word and with meekness be quick to hear so that we can grow in grace, so that we can hear what God would have us to, so that we can be more and more set apart into his image. Now notice what Paul says about the Christians at Berea, probably a very familiar verse to most of us, Acts chapter 17 verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, it says, in that they received the word with readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. They received with readiness what was being taught to them from the word of God, and they went about their business searching the scriptures daily and making sure they were told the truth. Now just pause for a moment and think about how much better we would be in every area of our life if we just listened more to the Word of God. Think about our relationship with our spouse. Love, submit. If we would listen and obey, how much better that relationship would be. With our children, provoke not to wrath. Honor thy father and mother. With your neighbors, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we begin to realize that the Word of God has a lot to say about our attitudes. And what we can begin to see is we can begin to see our shortcomings and we can begin to see where God wants us to go. And we begin to think to ourselves, that is way too daunting. Why even try? Let me ask you a question tonight. How much would change in your life if you just allowed 5% more of yourself to be swift to hear. Just take that baby step and become more swift to hear what God has for you right now. Don't, what is that saying? It's easier to eat an elephant one bite at a time. You know, we, we look at the daunting task, be perfect as I am perfect, and we think, whew, but what about just taking a 5% step tonight and becoming a little bit more swift to hear? and slow to speak. Now we must not take for granted the spiritual tenacity uh, and the complete dependence on the Holy Spirit that it is going to take to disengage our mouth and fully engage our ears. How many agree with that one? <clears throat> I'm talking about tenaciously fighting against the mind to run away with our thoughts before we've even finished the whole verse that we're trying to read. This is a trait that must be learned and mastered because we do not grow up with a listening ear. But consider just how important this idea is. Jesus said to the church many a times and to those believers in those early days, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He said that some 15 times throughout the New Testament. He said it to every church in the book of Revelation in those first three chapters. He says, listen, I have something for you that's going to help you out. So he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now Jesus understood the human struggle in the human spirit, that combative attitude towards change. But he also knew that there were going to be those that would hear, so he wanted them to hear so that they could have a change and grow up in Christ. Now, think about this. As we think about this idea of sitting up and paying attention. Think about the condemning statement that Jesus made to the multitudes in Matthew chapter 13. Why don't you flip there real quickly. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. And, and I, I want you to see this. And this ultimately is really what led to what Pastor Shepley was talking about this morning, where the Pharisees and Sadducees and the multitudes eventually just wouldn't hear because of their own choice and their own hard heart. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 13 says this, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Let me ask you a question tonight. Was it Christ's fault that they could not hear what he had to say? Obviously not. Today, is it the preacher or teacher's fault that people do not understand and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ or grow up in grace? Now, there's more of an opportunity that, yes, it could be the preacher or teacher's fault since men are fallible, but could it be that because of the, dispu- uh, the spiritual decay in the life of a hearer, that like the book of Matthew, uh, like in the book of Matthew, as Jesus said, we have become dull of hearing. This phrase, dull of hearing, gives us the idea of like someone having their ear full of wax. How many of you have ever had that experience of pulling a ear full of wax out? That's disgusting, isn't it? I mean, I'm just talking about seeing somebody else do it, not me. But, uh, you know, it's just, just disgusting. We, we think it's disgusting. I'm mean, seeing all that whack. Why would you allow that to build up in your ear? But, you know, why wouldn't we think of the way we apply our lives and we act towards God that we would build up wax in our ear? Why wouldn't we think that's disgusting? And, 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 and a disgust to God as we become lukewarm. Uh, But you think about this, as people become dull of hearing. God is trying to get through to them, and they're sitting blank face as they do not hear. Or, like in the age that you and I live in, this age of entitlement, where they're arguing and yelling back at God before God has given, uh, God has even given time to allow His Word to work in their life. It would be good for us to listen to phrases like Job told his friends in Job chapter 13, verse 5. Oh, that you would altogether hold your peace and that you should, uh, and it should be your wisdom. Or as Solomon said to his son in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27. He that hath knowledge spareth his words and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool when he, is, uh, when he holdeth his peace is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed as a man of understanding. We would do well to become better hearers and become more intentional in hearing the word of God. If we are going to live in this wherefore kind of faith, we have to have a change of attitude and become intentional hearers of the word of God. And as we become intentional hearers of the Word of God, we can take that step and let her be, become intentional or have a change in our actions. Our attitude to the Word of God has changed, which then allows us to hear what the Word of God is saying and hear specifically what James has been uh, told to write or instructed to write. And what we find then is we can have a change in our actions, first of all, by being intentional to lay aside sin. Paul and James give us very much the same instruction for every believer. James uses this statement, lay apart, where Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, put off. He would say, put off concerning the former conversation or the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 to put it off through the work of the Spirit, while James tells us to put it off by the work of the Word of God. And so you see these two working together, and the challenge that we're given as born-again, Bible-believing Christians to intentionally lay aside the sin that we once enjoyed, or intentionally lay aside the sin that the world tells us is okay. There's a kid's song that I'm sure many of you have sung in the past, These things I used to do, or the things I used to do, I do not do them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. Now, it's not a popular philosophy today, 
but we understand for the cause of Christ there's some things we are to set aside there are some things that we are to put off so that we can shine as lights in a dark world so we see this intentional laying apart but what what is it that we're called to lay apart well James answers that for us in verse 21 wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls he tells us in verse 20 as well this is our first point uh, we're to lay apart wrath now we're gonna come back to this idea a little bit later in our study so I'm not gonna touch on that tonight but you see second of all that we're to lay apart all filthiness we could say dirtiness or impurity we are touching the world and we need to be cleaned regularly it's like taking a shower after day of work we're washing off the stink of the day how many of you are thankful tonight that the person sitting beside you washed the stink of work off before they came to church we ought to want to wash the stink of sin out of our lives because of what Jesus Christ has done for us we ought to be just excited about allowing the work of God in our hearts help us to lay aside that filthiness as we are excited when our child comes home from work and they just stink to high heaven and we're excited when they go to the shower before they come and interact with us and we ought to be excited about the work of the Word of God doing it in our lives so that we would lay apart this filthiness but look at this as well as he says and we see thirdly let us see all superfluity of naughtiness now superfluity and naughtiness are two words that we don't use very regularly in our world today James as he uses this word superfluity is giving is giving us this idea of something that is done in a bun in abundance or as Strong's defines it super abundance so what he establishes is that we are to set aside something that we have done abundantly and he ties that to this word naughtiness now we have downplayed the intensity of this word naughty as we talk to little babies and little children uh, but this word gives us the idea of evil or wickedness Strong's defines it as depravity uh, trouble evil malice and wickedness so essentially James is saying we are to lay aside the overflowing wickedness that has once ruled our hearts and that's ultimately what we're to be involved in now obviously we can walk through the Word of God and we could spend months really going through this sanctification process of what God is asking us to lay aside but flip over just real quickly to Ephesians chapter 4 and let me just give you a couple quick brief thoughts you're thinking to yourself well what would we consider evil or wicked what would we consider filthiness what am I supposed to be putting away as a born-again Bible believing Christian Paul gives us a very concise uh, overview here of some things that we could do well to put aside or to lay apart there in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 23 if you're there you see these words and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness wherefore put away lying speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another be angry and sin not let not the Sun go down upon your wrath neither give place to the devil let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may give to him that needeth let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor we would say forceful expression of a desire or dissatisfaction and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice he says with all effort and all diligence and all intention put these actions aside and so you're wondering uh, pastor Rob what do I need to put aside what do I sh what should I be working on just underline those words circle those words highlight those words and ask the Lord to work in your life is there some area of improvement that I should be putting these things aside in my life 
so that again I can show the world that I have fully placed my faith in Jesus Christ and he is the reason why I'm putting these aside. I'm not putting these aside to look good. I'm not putting these aside to show that I'm more spiritual than anyone else. I am putting these aside because he is my savior and he is setting me apart for uh, his honor and his glory. So we see this battle. And how many would you agree in this simple few verses... Uh, these uh, eight verses that we just read in Ephesians chapter 23. How many of you can see that battle? Anybody see a battle? Um, I must be wicked. I mean, there's a battle right there. I mean, you think about that. Evil speaking. Pastor and I were just talking about this this week. It's easy to speak evil of someone because it takes no investment in our lives to help that person get better. We just tear them down and make ourselves look better. But he says, put it aside. Don't, don't speak evil. That corrupt communication. I mean, it's easy for us to go with the flow and use cutting words and use uh, funny things that are depraved in their nature, these statements. And so you see this need to con have control of our mouth and this wrath or, or this bitterness. It's a battle, friends, that we're in. And, James is saying by the word of God, Paul is saying by the spirit of God, be intentional to put these things aside so that you might stand out as a light in a very dark world. Now, I believe James gives us uh, an idea of how to continually lay these, side, these things aside, how Paul continually helps us to put these things aside. And I believe you see this as you see number two, that we need to be intentional in our walk. James says there in verse 23 or verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding in his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed indeed. We have to have that change of attitude and those change of actions to desire to receive the word of God. And what you find is God impacting our actions. And now we find that there are some things that we are laying aside. And what we are starting to experience is the blessings of God because we have not stayed in that filthiness that we once were. We're not... Uh, as, we, as we see these things take place, we're no longer satisfied with just coming to the Word of God and eating. We want to work out that application as well. I told the teens when I was working at a church in Georgia, if you like history, the Bible is the best history book you can ever read. If you like romance novels or geography, the Bible will take you all over the Eastern world. If you like sports or science, whatever subject it is, we find it in the Bible, and this is the greatest book we can ever read. But please understand, as James is stating here, the Bible is so much more than just literature to listen to and read, to study and to examine we find that it is an instruction manual that is to be practiced out in our daily lives. Remember, God's working from the inside out. So he wants us to take in and then work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are saved, therefore, or as James is saying, wherefore we're laying aside. We are grafted in, wherefore we become doers of the word, and not hearers only. Sometimes it's said like this. Baptism is the outward action or that outward profession of the inward grace that has been working in our lives. We want to show the world on the outside what God has been doing on the inside. God works in us as we study the word of God so he can work through us as we walk in the world. And so as we see what James is saying in verse 20 through 22 through 25, we could say this is where the rubber meets the road for our faith. Or we could say this is where we put our money where our mouth is. Now, 
You know, I'm sure we've all had our embarrassing moments where you walked out of the house and looked crazy. Anybody agree with that? How many has had an embarrassing moment? Uh, it just happened to me just the other day. I, I honestly I forget which day it was. And, uh, I try to do my hair nicely. Uh, I have crazy hair if I don't do it nicely. And I, I don't know, it was probably five, six hours into the day, and I walked back in the mirror, and I had this piece just in the middle of my head sticking out. I, the first thought was, how many people saw me with that single piece of hair sticking out? You know, I mean, it just terrified me. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to wet it down and get it down. It's not laying down. I don't know what to do now. And I just worked at it. You know, we, for the most part, are intentional with our physical lives. We don't want to look silly. We want to uh, look presentable as we leave our home. We take the time to look in the mirror and make sure what is in place and out of place. And if it's like our hair, we reach into the drawer and we grab a brush and we do whatever we can to get that fixed. We ought to want with the same tenacity to display for the world the glory of God as we want to display the glory of the outer body that God has given to us. And so we see this need for us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so we need to search the scriptures daily to find the daily principles for life and godliness. And we need to put into action what God shows us. We fix what needs to be fixed and strengthen what needs or seems to already be strong. And we battle day in, we battle day out to do for God because of what God has already done for us. Next time as we move more into the practical do's as James carries on through verse 26 and verse 27, what we're going to see is that James is going to give us the opportunity to live out our faith in a way that's going to impact multitudes of people. But understand tonight, as we think about this, as James tells us not to just be a hearer and a doer, how many of you just absolutely love people who are hypocritical? There's not a single one of us. And so we ought not to be hypocritical in our faith and intentionally hear God's word and not do anything about it. Yes, we need to be intentionally hearing, but we also need to be intentionally doing as well. As I, and I want to encourage you as, as we begin to close, because I don't want you to look and say, well, I'm failing in this, and I'm failing in that, and I'm struggling here, and, and, and this is a mess. When I was working with those plants during that summer in that orchard, I'll tell you this, I did not remember one vine that was grafted in, that was grafted fully and produced fruit before that summer ended. So we need to be careful that we are not so extremely hard that we have no hope in Christ. We have all hope in Christ. It is God that works in us and through us and for us, for His honor, for His glory. But I will tell you this, there were changes in that graph. And this is where the older I get, and please, guys, I'm, I'm not going fruity here, but this is the older I get, the more I appreciate journaling and, and really giving yourself the opportunity to look back. Here is who I was last year. Is there a change today? If there is no change, I can begin to ask God, God, why is there no change? I have been grafted. I do believe that your word is able to be that water and that nutrients for my soul. Why? Or I have grown. God, I'm excited for what you're doing in my life. I challenge you. Put some goals. Put some effort to this. Put some tangible ways for you to assess, am I truly growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or am I just a sitter, soaker, who will become sour? Because that's what sitters and soakers become. They become sour because they're so full of everything that they should be doing that they are not allowing themselves and not allowing themselves to allow it to work out that they become that critic that nobody is as good as them and nobody can do it like them. 
We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I challenge you to check your growth. We're going to get dirty. And we're not going to have it all together on the day, or we didn't have it all together on the day of our salvation. But if God is working in you because of what he has done to graft you in, you should see God working through you as you work out this grafting process as a child of his. See the privilege that we have been given to live in a wherefore kind of faith. I challenge us to say, God, I am so grateful for the salvation you've given to me. I want to be that light that shines in a dark place because of what you've done for me. I'm not doing it to uh, win your salvation. I'm doing it because of your salvation. And what a privilege that we have to have a war, wherefore kind of faith. We don't have to go out and kill people to, or, uh, if they don't turn to our, our faith. We don't have to go and break arms and legs uh, for salvation. We get to tell people about the matchless grace of God that reached down and picked out a filthy sinner like us and brought us and gave us those new clothes, that new life, that new attitude, that new action that says, hey, I just want you to look at Jesus. That's what it's about, and that's what this doing of the word is about. It's not to make us look weird, to make look God look amazing just as he is. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as Brian comes to maybe lead us in a brief hymn of invitation. We won't draw this out, but maybe God's been working on your heart. There's some things in your life that maybe you saw in Ephesians chapter 4 that you'd like God to begin to work on your life tonight. I'd encourage you to give that over to the Lord. I'd encourage you if you've realized, you know what? I've just been excessively eating from the Word of God, but I really haven't been applying the Word of God to my life. I would encourage you, as God maybe is speaking to that area of your life, that you do business with God wherever He's asking. What's God asking you to do? Will you do it? Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together tonight to praise you for who you are, for the Word that you've given to us. We can trust it. Uh, we can practically see in things that men have built on this world that your word is true. For many of us, we can see the matchless grace of God that has continued to use your word to graft us and to use your engrafted word to change us more into your image. It's a privilege to see that. I pray our salvation never gets old and the desire to shine as lights in a dark place never gets boring because of what you've done for us. Father, may you help us to allow this world to see the amazing grace of God that you've poured out in our lives. We thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for all you've done in our hearts today. I pray that you'd work in a way one more time tonight that would bring wonder and awe into our lives and just set us up to walk into whatever you would have for us in the next few hours or if you should tarry the next few days that we would be those shining lights for you. We thank you for this time. We ask you to work in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Ryan, what will we say? Just briefly. Turn your eyes on Jesus, 204. Turn your eyes on Jesus, 204. We'll just stand with us and we'll sing. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for us. I want to thank you for being here tonight. How many of you uh, jumped into that texting that we explained last week and received a text this afternoon? Anybody? 
I just want to let you know, we're not going to bombard you with texts on your phone over and over again. We're just going to help you remember, hey, there's a missionary presentation a little bit uh, early tonight. Just make sure you uh, come. So if you want to do that, again, it's just texting 40404, follow, and then space, at charity, BCNC, and, and we just want to help you stay connected. I also want to mention as well, and I don't think this is mentioned, we're going to stick with Facebook Live. And uh, if you're a part of Facebook, you'll start to see things that are set up as a notification that we're going to go live in so many days or so many hours. If you want to share that and invite people to, uh, that can't get to a church to uh, engage in our church, we'd love to have them. And uh, it'll still be on YouTube the following day, Lord willing. But uh, we're just trying to help you to have tools to reach your community, to stay engaged in our church, and just to... Uh, fall in love with the Lord just a little bit more. So uh, we're not trying to uh, bog you down with anything. We just want you to stay engaged in the work of the Lord. So just want to leave that with you. Again, Wednesday night, be back again, unshackled. Uh, hear about a great message on love. Anything else tonight? All right. Well, let's just be dismissed in prayer. Brother Ray, would you dismiss us tonight?